Good afternoon. Uh, we have Professor Fernando Rimors with us. He is a very well-known personality in the space of international education policy analysis, international planning, and uh, also on the governance and decentralization. He is with us uh, uh, today. Then he will be speaking on uh, leadership and uh, global education today uh, with us. Professor Rimors is Ford Foundation Professor of International Education and Director of Global, global Education of International Education Policy at Harvard University. We welcome him. He is a very good friend of Azim Prabhuji uh, Foundation and then he has a very uh, long relationship with us. And, um, we welcome him. Thank you very much for the introduction. It is my, thank you all very much for coming. My pleasure to be here. It is my first visit to Azim Prabhuji University. But it is not the first time that I think and talk about Azim Prabhuji University. I used to talk with uh, Dilip uh, Rajikar even from the time when this was just an idea uh, when it did not exist as an entity. So I am very glad to have the opportunity to come, meet some of you in person, and I thank you for the invitation to give this talk. What I would like to do in the next hour is to present some thoughts as a provocation on what I believe are, is a very deep transformation that is taking place in education and then leave another 30 minutes to have a conversation with you about these topics. So let me begin. Education, of course, is a very old endeavor, but education as a good for every person is actually a very recent endeavor in human history. As an idea, the idea that every person should be educated is only 400 years old. The first person who came up with that idea was a gentleman who was a religious uh, minister in what would be the Czech Republic today, a guy named John Amos Comenius. And Comenius lived through a time of deep religious intolerance. People actually killed each other because they had different religious beliefs. Uh, that led to essentially a 30-year uh, civil war in his country. And his own wife and two children died as a result of that violence. And these men, looking at this devastation and this horror, had the presence of mind to ask himself, why do we kill each other? Why do we do this? And his answer was, we kill each other because we don't have the means to work out our differences in peaceful ways. And then he recorded in a book called Didactica Magna, we should educate every person so we can have peace. This is the first written record, to my knowledge, that where someone argued that everyone should be educated. But 400 years ago, we did not have the technology, the means, to make this idea a reality. It would take another 200 years until people began to experiment with how to do this, how to bring it to scale. And there were a number of competing ideas. Uh, of course, as nation states began to form, they developed this interest in how to build public education systems to educate everybody. The very first person, uh, to my knowledge, that proposed that we should use systematic comparisons of education systems as a way to inform the creation of these public education systems was a French gentleman by the name of Marc Antoine Julien. His father had been involved in the French Revolution. He was growing up immediately following the revolution. He was, let's say, a journalist in today's terms. And this guy thought that there were people doing innovations in different parts of the world. For example, Pestalozzi had already proposed a very innovative way to school children. Another guy um, in a different country, England, had proposed Joseph Lancaster a way to educate everybody at low cost using what was called the monitorial system. And Marc Antoine Julien said, we should study in depth these innovations and use that knowledge to support the creation of these new public education systems. We should use the systematic comparative study of innovations as a way to help us think about how best to build this new education order that will give every person the opportunity to be educated. And we'll come back to this notion at the end of my talk, that in the study of innovation lies great potential to help us make progress in education. So, 150 years ago, in my own state, it was a 
was a gentleman by the name of Horace Mann, who basically visited every little town in the state of Massachusetts, convincing people that we should create an institution that gave everyone the opportunity to be educated. And he was doing that around the 1850s. So we are talking 150 years. This is really yesterday. But for most of the world, it's an even more recent history. For most of the world, it was really after World War II that where people again ask themselves, why did we cause such this horror? Why did we produce this devastation and destruction? And they concluded, we should create a compact that allows sustainable peace. And they produced one of the most beautiful documents ever produced by humanity, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This little two-page document contains 30 rights where basically those individuals who drafted the declaration said, in order to have sustainable peace, we should guarantee every person certain conditions simply because they are human, irrespective of where they come from in life, simply because they are a human being. And one of those rights, Article 26, was the right to education. This is the first time that the world community of nations agrees that we shall educate every child. And if you look, the institution that was established to achieve that goal was UNESCO. And UNESCO, in its constitution, the preamble of the constitution, has language that is reminiscent of Comenius. It says that since wars begin in the minds of men, it is in the minds of men that the defenses of peace must be built. So again, why do we want to educate everybody? So we can have peace. And what did UNESCO set out and do? Two things. The very same thing that Marc Antoine Julien had been doing right after the French Revolution, to study innovative practice, to look at positive deviants, to look at the people who were already finding a way to educate all the kids, to document that and to disseminate that knowledge. And how did they disseminate it? By bringing people together. Who did they bring together? Ministers of education, ministers of finance, people working in ministry. So for example, one of the questions was, how can we possibly educate kids in a country the size of India, or Brazil, or Mexico, where most people in 1948 lived in villages? How do we find an economically sustainable way to produce education in a village? And so through the study of these positive deviants, they discovered that there was such a thing called multi-graded instruction, that it was possible to prepare teachers to teach multiple grades at the same time in small schools. So UNESCO produced a bunch of reports documenting what multi-graded instruction was. They disseminated this. As countries began to urbanize, people began to move from villages to cities, they realized that in order to educate all the children, there was a tremendous need for buildings and to hire new teachers. So again, through the study of positive deviants, they found that some countries had begun to institute double shift education, where in the same building you could host two schools, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, in some cases three schools in the same building. They disseminated these. So it was as a result of the political commitment to advancing the right of education for all, the study of positive deviance, the study of the outliers, those cases that had already developed technologies that made it possible to achieve that political commitment, and the dissemination of this knowledge and the creation of a community, of a global community of people interested in this goal that we made our progress. I will come back to these ideas later, because I think that while the world has made a lot of progress, and while it is recent progress, so I'll think about it for a second. 60 years ago, the vast majority of the children in the world did not have the opportunity to set one foot in the school. And today, most of them do. This is remarkable, that as a species, humans have been capable of creating these institutions and providing children an opportunity to spend some years of their lives in those institutions with the explicit purpose of helping them develop the skills so that we can have peace. That is to say, we have invented institutions to help the next generation build a better world than the one that we're passing down to them. This is remarkable. There is no species that done, has done that. Other
other animals uh, manage to teach things for the next generation. So if you watch chimpanzees, they're very clever. You know how they can get a little stick and they can stick it on an ant hole. And they bring their ants out and they eat them. And by observing their parents, the little chimpanzees, learn to do that. But this is not what we're talking about here. We're not talking about passing the practices, the knowledge, and the skills that have allowed us to be to survive, to be adaptive to the next generation. We do that too. What we're talking about is providing the means to the next generation to improve the world, to make the world better. Now, if we're going to do that well, it's very important that we keep an eye in the world and not in the schools. And I think one of the real challenges of educators is that sometimes we are too inward looking. We look at our neighbors. We get so caught up in the day-to-day -day routines and in the many demands of teaching and leading that we forget why we created these institutions. And of course, if we are going to keep present what the purpose is, we have to look outside. So that's the purpose of my talk today. Can I have the next slide, please? So I'm going to make eight points today, or I'm going to try to make eight points. I may go quickly over some of them. How much time do I have left? Another hour? Yes, uh, if you want questions, then about uh, 30 minutes. About 30 minutes, all right. So the eight points, the next one. The eight points I want to make are the following. I'm going to talk about helping students develop agency. I'm going to explain why this is important. I'm going to talk about the changes, one of the most important changes taking place around schools and what it means for how we think about the purposes of education. I'm going to talk about the importance of helping young people develop agency in that context. And eventually I'm going to connect these to what are the challenges for educational leaders. Next slide. So one of the things that I've uh, spent a lot of my time with these days is looking at programs that help young people become architects of their own lives. I didn't always think this way. Let me very quickly tell you how I came to be interested in education. I was born and raised in the country of Venezuela. I was the first person to go to college in my family. I went to college because I had caring parents, but more importantly because I had teachers who saw in me possibilities I had not myself imagined. And I thought when I was finishing high school that I would work in public service. And I thought that the best way to prepare myself for public service was to become a lawyer. So I was getting ready to become a lawyer when the government of Venezuela launched a wonderful initiative designed to make everybody in my country more creative. This was called the Ministry for the Development of Human Intelligence. The minister at the time, my second year before I finished high school, wrote a little book called The Revolution of Intelligence. And the basic thesis of the book was, everybody can be smart. You don't, you are not born smart, you learn to be smart. I love that. At the age of 16, I thought that idea was profoundly transformative. Six months later, the minister wrote another book called The Right to be Intelligent. And the thesis was very simple. If we know that people can become intelligent, it is an obligation of a democratic state to create the conditions so they can become smart. And I thought that's what I want to do. I have no interest in studying law. I want to figure out how to do that. So I ended up doing an undergraduate degree in the main public university in Venezuela in psychology. And I was very interested in how to promote the creativity of young children, of preschool children. I was fascinated by experimental psychology was one of the youngest uh, persons to be hired as a faculty member in the Department of Experimental Psychology. And I was having a lot of fun doing experiments with four and five-year-olds, teaching them to be more creative in their drawings. But after doing that for a little while, I thought, there's really no fun in this. Actually, there is a lot of fun, but there is no intellectual challenge in this. It's, not, it's a no-brainer. Anyone can teach three classrooms of little kids how to be more creative. Anyone can teach a small group of kids Smart. The real challenge is, how do you do this for all the kids in the country? The real challenge is, how do you bring innovation to scale? So I realized I had to study something else which I hadn't studied in psychology, and that was how to think about education policy, planning, and implementation 
how to think about organizational change. So I went to Harvard to do a doctoral program with every intention of soon after that becoming the Secretary of Education of Venezuela, which I never did really become. As I was finishing my program uh, in the country next door, in Pakistan, Benazir Bhutto was elected Prime Minister. And she had studied in Harvard College. She reached out to a research institute in my university. She had her Minister of Education reach out and said, why don't you help us? Because we're bringing in a lot of new ideas to this country. We'd like to make this a vibrant democracy. And we think that education will be a part of that. Would you help us? So people in that institute approached me and said, wouldn't you like to help us with that? And even though working in Pakistan was, really had not been part of my plans, the idea of helping everybody become smart really had been in my heart for some years. And I said, absolutely. So I spent about three years of my life traveling around Pakistan doing the first large-scale survey of elementary schools, trying to understand why some schools produce higher levels of achievement than others, mostly rural schools. 500 schools where we interviewed the headmasters, we interviewed 1,200 teachers, we tested in mathematics and science about 10,000 kids. And from there, I went on to do similar things in Egypt, in Jordan, in a number of countries in Latin America. And for most of those years, I was really interested in helping more kids go to school and helping them learn the things that schools were trying to teach them. To me, helping them become smart was about that. I joined the World Bank briefly, and uh, my job at the World Bank was to design programs and work with governments to help more kids get into school and help them learn the basic literacies, language and mathematics. I joined the faculty at Harvard 16 years ago, went there to create a master's program I do right now, and for the first two years, that was still my focus. But then 9-11 happened. <coughs> and as I thought about 9-11, two things came to my mind. Some of those kids actually had gone to school in Pakistan probably about the same time that I was doing my research there. And I thought, how come I didn't pay any attention to what about their education might have caused these kids to use their time to cause so much grief? And the second thing that caught my attention is that many of those kids, the 19 hijackers of the plane, actually had fairly high levels of education. They had all had some college. And until that time, I had thought that if we simply got people to spend more years in school, the world would be good and wonderful and we would achieve community strength. But then I thought, well, it's obviously not enough to spend a lot of years in schools because you can either not learn some things that you need to learn so we can have peace, or you can learn the wrong things and decide to use your skills to still cause harm. So that caused me to change my focus and to pay a lot more attention to, in what way, is education preparing us be members of communities, of the local community, of the national community, of the global community. And so in that journey, I became a lot more interested in how do you help young people in that context develop their voice. And that is pretty much what I think about these days. My shorthand to talk about the, the way in which I summarize that is I call that 21st century skills. But when somebody comes and tells me, are you interested in the basic literacies? Say, no, I've been there, I've done that. That's not what I'm going to spend my time on. And so I'm going to give you two examples uh, that reflect some of my recent work. Some years ago, I remained very interested in helping uh, very poor kids around the world through education because I think it is with those children that you really test the power of education. When you look at what is it that education can do for kids who learn in schools things they couldn't have learned anywhere else. It's not fun to test the power of schools for kids whose parents have a lot of education because maybe they learn in school, maybe they learn in so many other ways. And so some years ago, I was at a conference on innovation to reduce poverty in Mexico. And the project that most interested me was a project that was produced by a 20-year-old student in the Faculty of Engineering, he was a third year student, as part of an educational program of service learning in his university, the public university, where every student was expected to do some social service of some sort. And so this student and the university had promised the students the full support to help them implement those changes. So this student decided that he wanted to reduce poverty in Mexico. And the first thing his professor told him was, well, 
in order to address a problem, you have to define it well. This is a very broad, what do you mean reduce poverty? Why don't you pick a place? So he picked a community. And then his advisor said, why don't you go to that place and try to understand why are people poor? So this person spent a few weeks, and it didn't take him long to figure out exactly what was happening. People in that community, based in the northern state of Mexico, of Nuevo León, in Monterrey, the city with the highest per capita income in the Americas, were largely migrants who came from the south of Mexico, which are the people of indigenous descent. And so these migrants came there to work in the factories, which were located in that place that paid a lot better money than they paid in the south. Maybe not unlike Bangalore. And so they came there, and women found a partner and conceived a child. And as soon as the child was born, the father disappeared. And so these women were left with a little kid. And now they had nowhere to leave a child. And they couldn't go to the factory because that was an hour and a half away from their homes. So they stayed home with this kid, no income. That's why they were poor. So the student said, what am I going to do about this? How do I solve this problem? He had a number of choices, right? He could have tried to find the fathers, he could have told them, taught them how to use contraception. But he said, why do they have to go to the factories? Why can the factories come here? So he thought hard about what kind of industrial process was simple enough that you could bring work to the community. And he found that producing liquid soap is actually a fairly simple process. It's really about mixing water with the right chemicals in the right proportions. So the student uh, developed the following project. Uh, he got a grant, about $10,000, to build a structure about the size of this room, right in that community, at the end of that community. He designed a three-month course to teach these women how to produce liquid soap. So the training involved not just the technicalities of how to mix that, because that's something you could do in one day, but it was a little bit of refresher of uh, chemistry, some refresher of some basic math, some basic accounting, a little bit of emphasis on self-esteem. I mean, these were women who were really very beaten by the experience of having left with this kid and without work and without any relatives around, so he had to boost their confidence. And basically invited these women for the course, and at the end of the course, gave them uh, a small loan, enough for them to buy a stainless steel container, the little flasks in which they were going to pour the soap and the chemicals they would need. And after producing the soap, they, they would come to him, he would do some quality control, uh, those who actually, the key here was to use clean water. If they didn't use clean water, they would have a program. But if they maintained some standards of quality, they then had a choice. They could either sell the liquid soap to him at a profit margin of 40%, or they could market directly at a profit margin of 70%. I visited some of these women in their home. I never thought anyone could be so happy making soap. Really, these were extremely modest homes. There was very little there. And these women just loved it. Not just because they were making money. They were making, on average, one minimum wage, which is not a lot of money. But remember, they were making zero before this program. So if you think about the rate of return of a program that brings you from zero to one minimum wage, I don't know of any other program that can do that in three weeks. Right? And so the point of this story is not that you can do a lot of good. This young fellow helped hundreds of women that way. Imagine what it means to discover at the age of 20 years old, that you can have this kind of impact in the world. This person is going to go on to be a leader for life. And why is this exciting? Because this didn't just happen. It happened because an educational institution said, let's create a program that takes our students seriously as intelligent and compassionate human beings and that supports them in creating an innovation that will make a meaningful difference in the world. Let me give you another more recent example. I spent the last two years studying a program to teach high school students in six countries in the Middle East how to create a business. It's a very simple program. It's a program where a business person comes to the school once a week as a volunteer to mentor a group of high school students and teach them how to create a business, beginning with taking an idea, turning it into a business plan, raising the capital, registering a company, producing this market, this product, bringing it to market, and then dissolving the company. So similar to what the young Mexican fellow had done with this woman, this program <coughs> does with high school students between the ages of 15 and 17. The name of the program is Injas al Arab. And I've done an evaluation, an experimental evaluation of the impact of that program, and I've interviewed 
media this young people. So the winners of one of these regional competitions were a group of relatively young women from Oman. Can you have the next slide, please? Um, next slide. So this was the Mexico program. Next one. Next slide. Yeah, these are the Omani girls. So I interviewed these girls in Morocco in a regional competition. And they had created a company to produce books, storybooks, that parents could read to their children. So I asked these women, these young girls, why did, you create, why did you choose this product? They said, because we were very interested. We think that education is very important. And in Oman, there are many people who do not finish high school. And we ch were trying to understand why. So we talked to our professors. We went to the university. We talked to some people there. And we learned that one of the reasons people don't do well in school is because they never learn to read properly. They never learn to read with understanding. They never develop the motivation to read to be independent learners. So we spent some time digging into this question of how does a person learn to read. And we realized that beginning early is very important. That at the age of five or six, it's actually too late. In fact, one of the best predictors of how good a reader, a person is going to be at the age of 15 is how many different words they know at the age of five. And so they said, we have cousins in other countries. And we know that it's very common in other places that parents would read to their children even since they're born, even before they can speak. But here in Oman, we don't have very many things that you can read. The books that exist are books for adults. So we decided to create a company that would produce books for children. Again, it's a simple idea, but imagine what it is to discover at the age of 17 that you have the capacity to take a big and important problem like high school dropout, analyze it into its root causes, find a simple solution, and implement it, bring it to scale. These women will go on to be leaders in whatever they do after that. So these are some of the data from my study of the impact of this program, which, as I mentioned, I conducted in six countries. Now, these are data from Morocco. So I asked the students a bunch of questions designed to measure this concept of being an architect of your own life, of gaining voice in the world. So this question measures something that is also termed self-efficacy. We asked the kids, do you think that you will achieve your goals in the future? And they had a scale from one to five. And what you get here, five being, I really believe I will achieve my goals in the future. And we group those who said four or five, those who really had the belief that they would achieve their goals. So this is the group that participated in this program that taught them how to do the business before the program began, after it finished. These are the kids who did not participate in the program. So before the program, these two groups are very similar. And they are actually fairly empowered because 75%, three and four, actually have self-efficacy. Now, these are not average kids. These are kids in cities. Their parents are educated. So you might call them middle class kids, right? But what is interesting is that at the end of the program, an additional 20% of these kids develop this belief that they will achieve their goals. Now, this is remarkable. But as a result of a simple experience to learn how to create a business, like a company to produce books, 20% of the kids who did not believe that they would achieve their goals in life have gained this confidence. Next slide. I see challenges as opportunities, a very important quality for leadership. Very similar story. Two thirds of the kids had this view, 95% before the program, 95% did after the program. Next slide, please. I believe that achieving my goals requires negotiating with others. Three quarters of them believe in the power of negotiation, 90 some percent after the program, believe in the power of negotiation. Next slide, please. I can see myself in a leadership position in the future. Two thirds of them before the program believe that. Most of them did after the program. Next slide. So these are powerful effects, really powerful effects, to think that a simple activity, experiential learning, taking your idea and following it through can have those kinds of effects is great. Why do I like these examples? Because they demonstrate that students can be engaged and happy with their learning. Because they demonstrate agency. 
they demonstrate that they can be in charge of their lives. And especially because we know the alternative. Next slide. The alternative in many school systems around the world is this. Students who are bored, who are disengaged, who may show up, but whose minds are somewhere else. This is unfortunately a very common experience in many education systems around the world. Next please. And now why do they get bored? Why is it that students get bored as well? The reason they get bored is because they don't see why they're there. They don't see how what they're learning in school connects to life outside school, much less connects to their future. So for those of us interested in leading education, this is the challenge. The challenge is to find the point for why we're doing that. The challenge is to make education relevant. The challenge is not to teach the kids a few things. It's not even to get all of them to come to school to spend there a few years. The challenge is to make sure that what you learn there really transforms your capabilities so you can, in fact, bring about, produce a better world, the kind of better world that that university student in Mexico is bringing about when he manages to create a solution to reduce poverty, the kind of world that these girls in Oman have learned to produce when they create the condition so that the kids who don't know how to read learn how to read, the kind of world that the woman who runs this program in 13 countries in the Middle East to teach business skills to young people is bringing about by teaching teenagers that they can make a difference. Next slide. Now, unfortunately, around the world, there is a fascination with a very simple and harmful model of education, of educational improvement. And this model pretty much goes like this. It really has imported ideas from the business world. The way to improve a system is to define the outcome, to measure the performance of the system, and then attach some consequences to the results. We call these standard-based reforms, and it has spread like wildfire. Everybody's doing this around the world. There's nothing wrong with this system if you measure the right things. But if we're lazy, we're going to measure the things that are easy to measure. So what's easy to measure? The things that don't have much consequence. It's easy to measure basic literacies. It's easy to measure basic numeracy. It's not very easy to measure creativity. It's not very easy to measure leadership. It's not very easy to measure imagination. But those are the very things that matter. Indeed, those are the kinds of things that Comenius probably had in mind when he was thinking that we should educate everybody so we can have peace in the world. Next slide. So I'm just going to make a little allegory here to remind us for why this is so serious, that we should be very thoughtful about what kind of results we measure. This is a picture of a computer science program in a university in the West Coast. I'm sure you haven't heard about these universities, a well-known Stanford School. <laughs> and uh, this is called the William J. Gates Building of Computer Science. The reason it's called the William J. Gates Building is because Mr. Gates gave the money to build that. But I was told, not by Mr. Gates, that he only had one condition in giving this money to Stanford, that this building be located in this particular place, diagonally opposed from the mathematics department. In fact, I took this picture from the window of a particular professor. This professor from Stanford was a visiting professor at Harvard, my university, when Bill Gates was an undergraduate student, taught mathematics. And Bill Gates got an F, which is a failing grade in that course. That was the last course Bill Gates got at Harvard, because that summer when he went home, not only was he really engaged with what he was doing with coding and programming, that F really bothered him. And he said, you know what? I'm not going back. So he never finished his undergrad. So I suppose building this building is a way for Mr. Gates to greet his former professor every morning from the window <laughs> and tell him how do you like me now. <laughs> but the more important point of this story for us is to think about the connection between that F and what Mr. Gates went on to do. Obviously, the way in which this professor of mathematics assessed the performance of Mr. Gates had zero predictive value of the kinds of contributions these men would go on to make in society, in the world. And isn't that what we do when we 
concentrate all of our attention in these very simple and imperfect systems that me measure a very narrow range of human capabilities. And when we make our whole efforts of educational improvement contingent on whether we can move the needle on something that measures a small fragment, perhaps the most, not the most important fragment, of human capabilities. So this is something we all need to think about. Because if the business is leadership, and if the business is to find the point of education, the point is in the future. The point is not the F, it's not the performance of the test. Can I have the next slide? I'm going to skip that one. Next slide. So I want to talk about something, next slide, that is happening in the world that we all should be thinking about, which is globalization. Globalization is not a new thing. Globalization is the coming together, the points of connection between different cultures or civilizational streams. Many centuries ago, we had something called the Silk Road. You've heard about the Silk Road, right? It went from Rajasthan. Those Rajasthanis were very active traders through that Silk Road. So that was a time of globalization, where you had cultures. I have been in the province of Xi'an. And you see the very visible manifestations of how Xi'an in China, the old capital of China, was a very cosmopolitan place, because it had all these contacts with different civilizations, you heard of Marco Polo, right, and so on. So globalization is not new. But there are times when the intensity and the frequency of those interactions of people from different uh, streams intensifies. And we are living, we have been for the last couple of decades, living at one of those heights of globalization. Why? Because of the spread of media, because of telecommunications technology, because of the internet, because of the ease of travel, we're all doing, you are all uh, into contact. First of all, you come from the entire country of India. Some of you may come from other countries. You're all in touch with visitors who come in and out, who come from other places. You all read things that are done in other places. You probably are uh, looking at newspapers and news from other places. So you understand what I mean. We live in the space of flows, as Professor Manuel Castells has defined the process of globalization. Next point. And so, how do we help young people find a voice in that context? That would be helping to find the point of education. I'm going to do a simple text, a test. When I think about globalization, there are all kinds of opportunities that come from globalization. And there are also risks that come from globalization, right? Um, the kinds of risks that don't commend us to think about education, because sometimes if you meet someone who looks different, may in fact be different in many ways. And if your response to that difference is to hunker down, to disassociate, to mistrust, that makes conflict more likely than if you have a different kind of response. So the World Economic Forum has spent the last few years developing a framework to think about the most important global risks. And I spent the last few years developing a curriculum from kindergarten to high school to prepare students to understand those risks, to get them to care about them, to give them the skills, to do something to minimize them. I won't have time today to talk about that curriculum, but I'm only going to show you the risks. I won't read them aloud because I'm mindful of the time. And I will simply ask you that as you read them, you ask yourself, think about a high school student that you know, and ask yourself, does this person even understand what this risk is? And if the answer is yes, that person is in great shape because they can understand the world in which they live. And if the question, the answer is no, there is obviously something the education system, the schooling of that person has not done well because it has not prepared them to understand the world in which they live. So I'm just going to put the slides for a moment so you can read them. There are economic risks. Stay there for a second. There are geopolitical risks. There are environmental risks. There are societal risks. And there are technological risks. And as you think about that high school student, if that student were to see this picture 
and could actually begin to understand what this is representing and could follow the logic, great, they're prepared to understand their role. But if they would be totally confused in looking at that, there is something the education of that person has not done well to help them understand the world in which they live. Next. Right. Next. So, given that that is the world in which students are going to live, how do we help young people find their voice in the world? Next. Next. Stop here. So most people, when they think about education and global competence, they think about having more people achieve higher levels of learning, higher levels of education, more years of schooling. Or they think about aligning the national curriculum with international standards. You may have heard about the PISA test, so the TEAMS test, right? So make sure that your teaching of science is at a par with the teaching of science in Finland, which is one of the countries that does very well in these international comparisons, or Singapore. But I think it's equally important to provide students knowledge and skills about the world and globalization. Next slide. I'm going to skip that. Next, next slide, I'm going to skip this. Next, 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 uh, next, 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 next. Now, what does it mean to teach in the era of globalization? For the last 150 years, the emphasis of schools has been in developing one particular kind of cognitive skills. I argue that is no longer sufficient to help people develop agency. If we're going to help people develop agency, we need to think about skills that fall in three categories. And those have to be intertwined the way you would imagine three threads on a road that you then braid to make a role, a role. Or imagine the double helix, right? Well, imagine a triple helix that would have these three components. And these things have to be developed at the same time. Next. So the development of global competency has to be seen through this lens. What are cognitive skills? There are three kinds. Processing and cognitive strategies, knowledge, and creativity. What we have been doing for the longest time is to develop knowledge. But how good is it to develop knowledge when you can have access to all the knowledge in the world in the internet? When the possibility to access that is increasingly accessible to anybody who has access to an internet connection. Next slide. Processing and cognitive, some educators do. If you have studied Bloom's taxonomy, when he organized that taxonomy, he was trying to focus our attention on the higher order skills. So we've been trying to do this for 50 years. That taxonomy was developed in 1956. Critical thinking, problem solving, analysis, logical reasoning, interpretation, decision making, executive functioning. Mind you, most schools around the world don't do this, right? But this, the point I'm making is, it's not a new goal. Knowledge, next slide, we have been trying to do for a little longer. Literacy, active listening skills, knowledge of subject matter, ability to use evidence, and digital literacy. This we've been working on for a while. This, next slide. This we barely do. And it's increasingly important. In my university, we are making great investments to develop the innovative capabilities of our students. Innovations such as the following. The president of Harvard initiated last year a grand challenge, an innovation challenge, where she said, I invite any student of this university to partner with at least another student from a different department in coming up with an innovative solution to a challenge in the field of education, public health, poverty reduction, environmental sustainability, or energy. And she offers $100,000 that will be distributed among 10 prizes. I've had the privilege to be one of the reviewers of the education designs, and I have been astounded at the creativity of our students. One of the winners of this prize last year was a team that included one PhD student in physics, one student in the School of Education, two students in computer science. They produced a physics book for self-instruction based on an iPad. 
And the beauty, and they got $10,000. The beauty of the price is not that $10,000 is enough for you to create a company. It's that it gives you the visibility to raise the capital to actually build the organization to do that. And we have another innovation called the iLab, the innovation lab. I now teach there. I used to teach my classes in a room like that. I teach a course on educational innovation, which is one of the things that I study. And I now teach that at the iLab. And that's very different from this class. I meet with the director of the team of the iLab, and they discuss what are the learning goals that you have, what are your pedagogical ideas. We're going to configure that room so you can achieve that vision. And so they gave me a room that has very comfortable moving chairs. And so for some parts of the class, I lecture. I then say, let's do a small work in small groups. And groups of four get configured. We bring out rolling blackboards, ceramic boards, and it becomes a workshop where people are doing work for 15 minutes. And then I say, now we're going to have longer groups. You can rearrange the room anyway. And then you open those doors, and you go into a workshop type of space where each of my students has a workstation. And they go and they spend the rest of Friday, I think his class on Friday morning, Friday afternoon, and the weekend actually building an organization, creating an organization. And in that lab, we invite people who are funders. They visit periodically, so they see what the students are working on, and they have access to capital. Why are we doing those things? And we're not the only university by any means doing that. Because we are very interested in innovation and creativity, and we have finally discovered that innovation and creativity doesn't just come from knowing a lot of things. It comes from having the opportunity to design something, to design, and there is a pedagogy that makes it more likely. This pedagogy that I'm using is not very conducive to, to teach how to create anything. It's conducive to share information, which is what I'm doing today. But if I wanted you to create something, I should engage you in the act of creation. And this physical configuration is a barrier to that. So you get the point. Next slide. Interpersonal skills, increasingly important. Most things that we achieve in life, we don't achieve alone. We achieve with other people. But to get along with other people, you have to know how to... Next slide. You have to know... Next one. To communicate, collaborate, teamwork, cooperation, coordination, interpersonal skills, empathy, trust, service, conflict, negotiation. Next slide. And you also need to learn to lead, which means you take responsibility, like those young women in Oman took responsibility to reduce literacy in their country, or that young man in Mexico took responsibility to reduce poverty in his country. And you have to be able to communicate with others what your ideas are to do that. Imagine how many people this student in Mexico had to communicate with so that he could get the support of his university to build his project. And you have to learn how to tell a story of self. Who are you? And what do you want? And you have to develop the capacity to influence other people. Next slide. And lastly, you have to learn to govern yourself. The Greeks used to call this character. You have to work on yourself. Not just self-knowledge, but being able to govern yourself so you can achieve anything. So what does that mean? It means that you need an open mind, flexibility, adaptability, capacity to appreciate culture and art, personal and social responsibility, capacity to engage with people who have different cultures, appreciate diversity, adaptability, and so on. Next one. You need a work ethic where you have initiative, self-direction, responsibility. You get it. Next one. And finally, you need to be able to self-regulate. You need to recognize your emotions. You need to make sure they don't interfere with what you're doing, right? Somebody makes you angry, you don't immediately tell them you're making me angry, or you slap them in the face. You learn to control yourself and to analyze why is this getting me upset, why is this person doing this, what would be the most effective way to diffuse this situation or to develop a working relationship with this person. I need to take care of your physical and mental health. Next slide. Yeah, I'm going to stop on this one because I want to have a discussion. So, I think that if you pay attention to what is changing in the world, it's very easy to see that we need to change what schools are doing if we're going to actually help people transform the world. And I say we have to use the very same method that Marc Antoine Julien proposed at the time of the French Revolution, which is trying to find the people who are doing that already. They may not be calling it innovation or 21st century skills, but they have, through their own practice, discovered ways to do that. Maybe they're doing it in a very small scale, just like the very first people who invented multi-grade education or double-shift education were doing it in a small scale. 
But if we find them, if we study what they're doing, if we document it, if we share that knowledge, there is good evidence that this is exactly how we have built these remarkable institutions that we are the only species to have invented that allow the next generation to invent the future. Thank you very much. Do we have time for some questions? Maybe 15 minutes or something. All right. So we'll have some comments or questions and some readings. I have a question about um, the example you gave about the students um, in Oman or the soap factory example and uh, the, graph, the graphs that you showed us about students uh, becoming more um, self-efficacious self and you said that, and you said, so my, my question is what aspect of, you, you said it's about doing good and, uh, that's what I inverted, doing good and about putting leadership skills. So do you think it's I mean, it could also be only about leadership skills, right? I mean, what do you think there's more to it? Is, is there the leadership aspect or the compassion aspect? No, if, you look at, if you look at the framework that I just shared, when I talk about 21st century skills, they go together. The kind of leadership I'm talking about is not the leadership to hijack an airplane and destroy a tower. It's the kind of leadership that takes responsibility to improve the world. And that, I think that very much has to be taught. I don't think we should take that for granted. We should cultivate the sensibilities of people to first of all understand what are some of the opportunities for you to lead a meaningful life. What are some opportunities for you to make a difference? But not only sensibility. You know, I know plenty of people who have a lot of social sensibility who are inept at making any difference. They cry when they see poverty, but they don't do the first thing to make any visible difference in it. So the second thing is the capacity to think rationally and strategically about what's a good point of entry here? What's a good way to make a difference? And the third thing is then figuring out, once you find the point of entry, how do you create an approach that actually can gain some traction? It's not just coming up with good ideas, it's being able to implement the ideas, which probably is going to require others. So it's all these things together, the, the, the kind of 21st century competency that I am describing to make a difference in the world has to simultaneously develop all those components not just one of them. So what I hope I have argued for is an integrated approach to think about 21st century skills. That's what I mean when I say the triple helix, is all these things have to be together. Of course, you can develop leadership without ethics, but that's not what I'm interested in. I think you, if we're going to do good education to prepare people to improve the world, we have to do all of that at the same time. And that's probably the reason why they were more satisfied, because, because they were to be helping they were causing change in the world. And I, I cannot answer the question. I don't know what the mechanism is for why those students, what the only evidence I have is that those students actually gain skills in a number of the domains that I have mentioned here. Could they have gained the same skills if they had done something else as opposed to making a change in the real world? I can answer that because I didn't study it. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for a very interesting talk. I have a couple of questions. Right? Uh, as you were presenting, I was uh, thinking of that even though the idea obviously is excellent, but how do you make it sustainable and scalable at the same time? And one of the things that comes to my mind is that the people who are obviously in very close contact with the school children, and here I speak specifically about high school, let's say, so, um, are the teachers. And till we figure out a way of somehow including innovation or a stress on it. Now, how do you inculcate that in children in the teacher's curriculum itself? To me, it seems a little difficult other than this project-wise. You know, you could go to a particular school or a particular district and do a project and come back. But then how do you keep it moving and how do you scale it? So uh, to get this into the teacher education, their curriculum, uh, or how it is that you want to So I would want uh, sort of your comment on that. So let me first agree that where the rubber hits the road here is exactly in the interactions between students, content, and teachers. That is what needs to change if a new set of goals are going to be implemented. No question. And I'm also in agreement with what I think is an implicit assumption in your question, which is that changing teacher practice is very, very difficult. Everywhere. Very hard. At the same time, changing teacher practice is possible. Teachers, like any of us, 
can learn. I, I have learned since I began to teach things I didn't know when I began to teach. And why did I learn them? I learned them because I've taken seminars. I've participated in projects with colleagues where they observe how I teach, we discuss how we do, and because I also learn from my own students. I collect feedback. In fact, every semester when I finish teaching, we give, as a matter of routine, it's not just me, everyone at Harvard, every student gets a little survey where they give feedback to the professor on the class that has just taken place. And I read those surveys and take them very seriously. Like I agonize over them, I read them, and I discuss them with my wife, who's also a professor, and whose expertise is actually teacher education and early childhood education. And so we read those things together, and I still do it. And now I have two sons who are 18 and 9 and 16. They laugh because since they were little, I discuss these surveys with them. And some of them will say, well, don't take that feedback that seriously. I say, no, this is the only way I can improve if by taking this feedback seriously. So teachers can learn. We all can learn. Which, and the way to say that is, we can structure conditions that make it possible for teachers to learn. Now, I don't think that initial education is the only lever. It's an important one. But I think a lot more important is teacher education once you're practicing as a teacher. And it's funny, because I think most countries around the world have this equation backwards. We spend a lot of energy and attention in initial education and almost no attention, no strategy in in-service development. And I think what we can actually change most is what you be teaching. And the kinds of questions I had when I began to teach back in Venezuela as a young faculty member were very different from the questions I had when I went back to teaching after I had worked on the World Bank and so on. And those were different than the kinds of questions I have now. You know, teachers have these trajectories, these developmental trajectories, where as a result of maturation, where you are in your career, you are ready to learn different kinds of things. And so I think it is possible to invest energy in supporting teachers so they can make those changes. But before we know what are the changes, what are the practices, that we want teachers to be implemented to achieve these competencies. What I've tried to argue for today is that we should study those teachers and those groups that are doing that. And my assumption is that in India, as in every other country, there are people doing innovative things that we should learn from. I just come from spending about a week in Rajasthan looking at one innovation that does two things. What is it called? Kevala Education Foundation? So you may have heard about the Kevala Education Foundation where basically an, an innovator has created a program that brings college graduates to work for two years in a village and with a head teacher. And at the same time, he engages head teachers in a four-year process of professional development while they are in service. Fascinating. This is not designed directly to impact teacher practice. It's designed to impact the practice of head Teachers. But it's a remarkable process. And so remember what Marc Antoine Julien suggested two and a half centuries ago. Let's study from and let's study the innovations that have already happened, taken place. Let's understand them well. Let's sequence their DNA. Because that is how we're going to find out what is the kind of change that has a better hope of being implemented at scale. I think that's what we could do. Those of you in this university have a fantastic opportunity in that this university has a connection with the Azim Pranji Foundation, which has been supporting innovations of this sort. I had a conversation with one of your professors a little while ago, whose name I have forgotten for a third time. My apologies. What is it? Shashi. I talked to Professor Shashi a while ago, and he was describing to me a fascinating journey of innovation that he led where he first conceived of a program to help district leaders think of their own leadership differently. He did that for about a year. And then, as a result of what he learned, he modified that program and implemented a different version of that program. What a, what a unique opportunity to be able to learn from someone who has been doing his own experiments with truth, to quote Andy, right? with school change. If I were you, and I had to write a research paper, I would say, let's study this thing. Talk to him. Say, I want to interview you. I want to understand very well what you did. Tell me where you did it. I would go and talk to the people who were trained. I would look at how those schools have changed. 
and I would make that a little research paper that would document the experience of that innovation. And I'm sure that if you scratch below the surface, you will find that it's not just him and not just that, that there are tons of things below the radar that will begin to appear just as we look for them. So, sorry for the long answer here. <laughs> Professor, for such a nice discussion. Uh, one thing is about the Venezuela, because uh, when we talk about uh, these leaders, what leaders can do, uh, whether these changes, which are major national changes, can come from the political leadership, or that can really be catalyzed by the students like me or others. Because sometime I feel that uh, Hugo Chavez was there when, uh, as the head of the state, and there were so many things, innovations were coming uh, due to the political leadership, and that translates into the reasons for the people. So, so how, how, how it goes like? When, so to, answer, to answer your question, yeah. the experience that I described to um, make everybody smart in Venezuela happened way before Chavez. I am not as young as you are. It happened 30 years ago. <laughs> And, uh, of course, political leadership makes a difference to education, but it's not the only thing that makes a difference. In my experience, I think that we tend to underestimate and understudy the capacity of ordinary people to produce great things. And we have a discourse that is excessively focused on people in positions of authority. And the truth is, in my experience working in many different countries, there are very serious limits to what people in positions of authority can do to implement change at scale. They talk as if they had a lot of power, but in practice, when you look at the connection between what they declare and what actually happens, there's not a very strong connection. So, I, there's no question in my mind that Margaret Mead was right when she said, never underestimate the power of a small group of people to change the world, because indeed, nothing great has ever been achieved any other way. The more I think about it, and the more I look at the process of change, the more I believe that she was absolutely right. And what I think we need to do is develop the sensibility, the intellectual discipline,